Good afternoon. Welcome to this breakout session uh, focused on Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy in Action, Lessons Learned from the Born on Time Program. My name is Dominique La Rochelle and I'm the Head of Gender Equality and Program Impact at Save the Children Canada. Over the past five years, I've had the chance to work on a wonderful program called Born on Time, which is the first public-private partnership dedicated to the prevention of preterm birth, um, which is now the leading cause of death of children under five around the world. So this program has been implemented by three Canadian NGOs, uh, World Vision Canada, Save the Children Canada, as well as Plan International Canada, in three countries, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Mali. Uh, we've had the chance to work with two uh, great uh, funding partners, Global Affairs Canada as well as Johnson & Johnson. So the objective of this program was really um, to try to, to address uh, preterm birth, to try to prevent preterm birth. And to do that, we focus on addressing the risk factors of preterm birth. And all of those risk factors have very strong gender equality dimensions, meaning that if you really want to make uh, some impact, achieve some impact, you, you have to look at the gender dimensions of all those risk factors and take dedicated action to address uh, any gender-based barriers or gender inequalities that relate to those risk factors. Factors. To do that, at the beginning of the program, um, the, the Born on Time team and the Gender Equality Working Group in particular developed a gender equality strategy uh, to address all of those gender equality uh, dimensions of risk factors as well as uh, uh, different gender-based barriers that may affect um, preterm birth. Um, so what we did is that we focused this strategy around three main areas of action, uh, empowering women and girls, engaging men and boys, as well as making health services more gender responsive. Um, now we've, you know, we're, we're closing up this uh, program. We're learning a lot about the impact uh, we've been achieving. So, so today we thought it would be important and, and interesting to hear directly from some of the stakeholders of this program uh, who have worked very hard uh, over the past five years to implement the gender equality strategy, but have also benefited from the work uh, done uh, on the ground in the three countries. So today we'll have the chance to hear from uh, three great people. Um, we'll hear from uh, a, an adolescent girl from Bangladesh. We'll hear from one of our staff members in Ethiopia, as well as from a midwife in Mali. And they will all share with us some of the, their reflections on the program, what they have seen uh, on the ground, and how has Born on Time uh, helped prevent preterm birth and address gender inequalities in those three countries. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the videos and uh, we will uh, be around as well to answer any questions you may have at the end of the session. Thank you and enjoy the videos. In Amara region where the Bruno Time program works in Ethiopia, gender roles and norms are deeply rooted. Women have limited autonomy and uh, decision-making power in key reproductive health issues. There is also a high rate of early child marriage, forced child marriage, as well as gender-based violence. Due to this, uh, gender equality was one of the key aspects of programming in, in the Born on Time program in Ethiopia. And one of the approaches we use towards gender equality traditional power holders like religious leaders so as they promote utilization of key proactive health services as well as uh, they participate in reducing uh, harmful traditional practices that uh, perpetuate gender inequality. So the main engagement program, men in the community come together, men with different behaviors, men who have reputation in the community, who have positive behaviors and who are influential, as well as men who exercise intimate partner violence and um, who drinks a lot. They come together and they discuss their opinions and attitudes uh, towards maternal health on gender issues on reproductive health rights. So about 35 men came together to discuss their opinions and these are facilitated by trained uh, facilitators uh, which include health extension worker, the Kabali manager as well as a representative community, community member. 
after the main engagement program, we have seen a number of positive stories, a number of changes in attitudes and practice among the men in the community. And one such example is Case de Salim, who is a young priest, 35 years old, is married and is here for uh, children. He says before he engaged in the male uh, dialogue program, he never understood how to understand the household uh, activity was. He used to get mad and he used to yell at his wife whenever she says she, she is tired. But uh, now he realized that the number of activities his wife is engaged in, like fetching water, uh, collecting firewood, so washing clothes, uh, cooking, making the local beer at household level, all these activities are tiresome and uh, the workload is significant. He said he never used to think uh, caring for the child was his responsibility, but the male engagement dialogue helped him to understand he needs to treat his wife as an equal partner. And also uh, he realized how um, early child forced marriage was uh, damaging the lives of uh, adolescent girls. So uh, he, he started to practice positive change uh, in terms of supporting his wife, in terms of involving involving her in household decision making as well as supporting his daughter uh, so that she gets excellent in her education. She, he never, uh, he makes sure that she never misses her school even for one day, uh, according to his explanation. His wife, Prahani, said that uh, uh, she's astonished with the behavior change she sees in her husband. And uh, she wishes, I mean, they have, uh, he have got this training, not only him, uh, also the other committee members have got this training so that she was able to deliver at her facility. That is the wish she expressed, she expressed once she saw the change in him. So this work is very important because um, without addressing the social norms that affect maternal and newborn health, we cannot see uh, the result we want to see. So improving the quality of uh, life of women and uh, uh, adolescent girls have significant effect in improving uh, uh, maternal and newborn health and in, re in reducing uh, preterm births and neonatal mortality. Hello, my name is Ruth. The Sansa. I'm a midwife in the healthcare center here in Mali. Thanks to Born on Time and the trainings that I received with Born on Time, I've been able to really improve the way that I work. Previously, in consultation with women, we were asking clinical questions, but with Born on Time training, we really try to adapt care based on women's specific needs and also adolescents and uh, healthcare centers. We give information to women also and try to see if there are risky behaviors that could be the cause of premature birth or if there is something that prevents girls and adolescents to from coming to healthcare centers. Thanks to born on time trainings, we made some awareness campaigns with uh, women associations and groups and showed them how these risky behaviors can can provoke uh, can trigger premature birth or uh, miscarriages such as uh, exposure to dust smoke and manual labor during pregnancy thanks to these information that we gave, we really helped women to pre and prevented premature birth. Uh, with teenagers, well, first we uh, gave information to women, who then in turn gave information and made their uh, little daughters or their sisters aware of this. If uh, teenagers do not come to healthcare centers, then their needs are not really taken into account. But when they come here in the healthcare centers, we are able to help them and to solve uh, problems. There are several problems with teenagers. Risky behaviors can create premature birth and also sexually transmitted diseases. We had a few uh, chats and, and, and discussion groups 
groups with uh, teenagers and we show them how they can prevent STDs and premature birth and at the same time we show them uh, family planning methods. Adopting these family planning methods help them not only to prevent uh, undesired early pregnancies but also sexually transmitted diseases like HIV AIDS. Also thanks to training with Born on Time we uh, we gave information to men, not only physically supporting their wife, going to consultations, but also uh, moral support and uh, taking over manual labor during pregnancy. Born on Time really helped to speak with, the, with men in our community to fight against a premature birth and undesired uh, pregnancies. আমার নাম মুসাফা তামান্না সরকার মুন্নি আমি এবার ইন্টার ফার্স্ট ইয়ার প্ল্যান ইন্টারন্যাশনাল বাংলাদেশে যখন বর্ণন টাইম প্রজেক্টটা আমাদের শহর ইউনিয়নে আসলো তখন আমরা আমি জানতে পারি যে সেখানে আমাদের বিষয়েও বিশেষ করে কৈশোরকালীন যে সমস্যাগুলো ওখানে সব আলোচনা করা হয় তো আমি সে সেক্ষেত্রে ওসব জানার পরে আগ্রহ আমার জন্মালো এবং আমি অ্যাডোলেসেন্ট গ্রুপে সে সময় যুক্ত হই এখানে কিশোর কিশোরীদের বয়সন্ধিকালের স্বাস্থ্য সম্পর্কিত বিষয়ে যেমন তাদের মাসিক ব্যবস্থাপনা আবেগ নিয়ন্ত্রণ ক্রোধ তারপরে জেন্ডার সংবেদনশীলতা বাল্য বিবাহ বয়সন্ধিকাল অপরিণত বয়সে শিশু জন্মের কারণ ও এর ফলাফল যেটা প্রতি মাস অন্তর অন্তর হয়ে থাকে তখন যে সত্যিই মনে হয় তাই করা যাবে না আসলে তখন ভাবতো যে এটা একটা আলাদা একটা মানুষের মানে একটা রোগ হিসেবে ধরতো ল্যাম্প বরণ টাইমের অ্যাডোলেসেন গ্রুপে আমরা যুক্ত হইলাম তখন সেখানে বিস্তারিত বিষয়ে সব আলোচনা আলোচনা হওয়ার পরে আমরা জানলাম যে আসলে এটা একটা স্বাভাবিক বিষয় অন্যান্য অন্যান্য যেমন পরিবর্তনগুলো আমাদের মাঝে হয়ে থাকে এটাও মাসিকটাও সেরকম একটা সাধারণ বিষয় আমাদের লাইফে সো সেটাকে কোনো জটিলভাবে সেটাকে না নিয়ে স্বাভাবিক ভাবে যে আমরা এই সময় যে পুষ্টিকর খাবার গ্রহণ থেকে শুরু করে যাবতীয় যে কাজগুলো আছে সেগুলো করার ক্ষেত্রে আমরা সচেতন হই ওখান থেকে বল যদি বলি যে একজন গর্ভবতী মায়ের ক্ষেত্রে কারণ একটা গর্ভবতী মা সে নিজে না তার বাচ্চাটাও তার মাঝে বেড়ে ওঠে তাকে সঠিকভাবে পৃথিবীতে আনার জন্য অপরিণত বয়সে শিশু জন্মের হাত থেকে তাকে মুক্তি দেওয়ার জন্য একটা মায়ের অবশ্যই পুষ্টিকর খাদ্য খাওয়া দরকার বাল্য বিহ এখানে ছেলে একজন মেয়ে যখন আঠারো বছর বয়সের আগে তার বিয়ে হয়ে যায় হয়ে গেলে একটা মেয়ের ক্ষেত্রে সে যখন বিয়ে হয়ে যায় তার শারীরিক বৈশিষ্ট্য ঠিকভাবে গঠন না হওয়ার কারণে সে সে নিজেও শিশু আর একজন কিশোরী যখন পারিবারিকভাবে নির্যাতিত হয় তখন তার জীবনের যে লক্ষ্যগুলো সে লক্ষ্যগুলো পূরণ করতে সে সক্ষম হতে পারে না তারপরে যে তার বারন্তটাও আসলে ঠিক সেভাবে হয় না এখানে বাল্য বিভাবে আমাদের যা অ্যাডোলেসেন্ট গ্রুপের একটা মেয়ে সে যখন ক্লাস এইটে পড়ে তার বাড়ি থেকে তাকে জোর করে বা তার অমতে বিয়ে দেওয়ার চেষ্টা করা হয় সে সে তো জানে যে বাল্য বিবাহর ক্ষতিকর দিকগুলো সে জানতো কারণ সে নিয়মিত সেশনে আসতো তো যখন সে তার বাবাকে বোঝায় ব্যাপারটা বাবা মাকে তখন তারা তার কথা শুনতে আসলে রাজি হয় না তার বিয়ের মানে কাজ কার্যক্রম এক পর্যায়ে ফাইনালের দিকে তখন সে আমাদের মানে আমাদের সাথে নিয়ে তো জানানোর পরে সবাই মিলে আমরা সেখানে তার বাড়িতে গিয়ে সেটাকে দমন করতে পারছি এবং বর্তমানে সে ক্লাস টেনে আছে মানে পড়াশোনা সে তার বন্ধ হয়নি চালু অবস্থায় আছে এখন আসলে মেয়েরা এই গ্রুপে সেশন করার ফলে তারা জানতে পারছে যে আসলে একটা মেয়ের জীবনে বাল্য বিবাহটা আসলে কতটা খারাপ প্রভাব বিস্তার করতে পারে এখন তারা নিজেরাই নিজেদের বিয়ে বন্ধ করার জন্য নিজেরাই পদক্ষেপ নিতে পারে আগে তাদের মনের মধ্যে যে ভয়টা ছিল আসলে কোথায় যাব কিভাবে কাজ করব কার কাছে যাব মানে সেটা আসলে ঠিক করতে পারতো না যে অ্যাডোলেসেন্ট গ্রুপের সবচেয়ে বড় সাফল্য হচ্ছে বাল্য বিবাহ প্রতিরোধ তারা এখন নিজেরাই তাদের নিজে বাল্য বিবাহটাকে প্রতিরোধ করতে পারতেছে এবং তাদের জীবনের যে লক্ষ্য যখন আমরা এই করোনাকালীন সময়ে আমাদের সেশনটা মাঝখানে কিছুটা মানে আগে যতজন আমরা যেতাম 
দেখা যাচ্ছে যে তার পরবর্তী যে মহামারীটা শুরু হওয়ার পরে আমরা সেই গ্রুপের মেম্বারদের কিছু কিছুটা মানে ছাটাই করে অল্প কয়েকজনকে নিয়ে আমরা সেশনটা চালাতাম যেমন আমরা জানি যে সামাজিক দূরত্ব সামাজিক দূরত্ব মেনটেন করা আর বাইরে গেলে মাস্ক অবশ্যই অবশ্যই মাস্ক পরে বাইরে যেতে হবে এবং সেগুলো আমরা আমাদের এলাকা প্রথমত আমরা পরিবার থেকে শুরু করে আমাদের স্থানীয় পর্যায়ে যা বিভিন্ন আলাপ আলোচনার মাধ্যমে যা মানে যার সাথেই কথা হয় তখন তাদের মাঝে এই বিষয়গুলো সরিয়ে দেওয়ার চেষ্টা করি কিন্তু যখন আমরা এই অ্যাডোলেসেন্ট গ্রুপে যুক্ত হইলাম তখন আসলে আমাদের মনের মধ্যে একটা সাহস জন্ম হলো আসলে সব আমাদের মানসিকতাটা সেখান থেকে পরিপক্ক হইল এবং আমরা নিজেরাও একটা মনের মধ্যে সাহস জোগাড় করতে পেরেছি ওখান থেকে তারপরে কোথায় গেলে আমরা আর যে সমস্যাগুলো আমরা সম্মুখীন হচ্ছি সেখান থেকে আমরা খুব ইজিলি পরিবারের লোকদের জানিয়ে বর্তমানে সবাইকে জানিয়ে এখান থেকে বেরিয়ে আসতে পারতেছি So thank you for joining us today for our session on how to gamify your work to engage Canadians. As the world is increasingly moving online and industries of instant gratification are becoming more and more popular, attention spans are becoming increasingly limited. And in an age where we need to engage these audiences faster than ever before, an innovative approach to engaging Canadians in global health is to gamify your work. Um, during today's discussion, we will hear from representatives of organizations who have found success in doing just that. We'll get into why they did it, what they learned, and any advice that they have for organizations um, considering a similar route. Um, so I will just introduce our panelists today. So joining us today, we have Roberta Gremlick from uh, Canadian Food Grains Bank and Michael Stevens from uh, the Canadian Red Cross and Hung Tran from One. Um, so to get things started, we will dive into to why we all decided to gamify our work and what kind of led to the development of those games and activities. Um, so Hung, let's start with you. Um, one of the games that One has developed is uh, the Vaccinator Quest. This is something that was developed pre-pandemic, but of course vaccines are top of mind for everyone right now. So it's definitely very relevant. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about why you decide to make a game focusing on vaccines and why you chose a more retro style uh, online game? Yeah, thanks for having me today uh, on this panel um, and uh, great to have the other two speakers as well. Um, so yeah, so for one, we've always um, had success with uh, a lot of our campaigns like gamifying it using quizzes and, and questions. Uh, we've had a lot of success with, uh, a, you know, a nine country quiz asking people whether they could uh, place uh, uh, nine African countries on a map or um, asking people about um, uh, this uh, sexist uh, laws uh, quiz and asking them, you know, if they could uh, like figure out what these uh, sexist laws are. Uh, but then for when it came to um, the vaccine, uh, our vaccine campaign, so uh, we were focusing on supporting uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance ahead of their uh, replenishment. And uh, we wanted to tell the story of how important uh, it is um, that Gavi is able to support and providing access to vaccines in the most region, uh, remote regions in the world. Um, so, so we didn't want to, you know, continue our previous success of quizzes and trivia and, and focusing too much on facts and the importance of, of vaccines, but we wanted rather to focus on the idea of, um, you know, these healthcare workers who were working really hard, um, going through different uh, routes and, and different mode of transportations to uh, help have, um, provide access to vaccines in remote regions and so that's why the idea of a game uh, came about okay how do we how do we tell that story of of people um of these healthcare workers uh, delivering vaccines um so so that was the idea of, of our game and um of our campaign yeah i've tried it myself and i 
loved it. Uh, it reminded me of games from my childhood, but it was still really cool to, to get into the shoes of somebody delivering those vaccines. It was really great. Um, Roberta, the Force to Flee game from Canadian Food Grains Bank is totally different. It's meant to be done in person with a group. Um, and I've heard that it has really evolved over the years. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how that game has was developed in uh, its evolution. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, so Forced to Flee is a, a simulation activity or, or game. And actually how it came to be was that in the early 2000s, Canadian Food Grains Bank designed a 24-hour refugee simulation, uh, which involved busing high school students out to like a provincial park. Uh, and it was quite elaborate, uh, dealt with some very real scenarios. Uh, and I believe actually involved many organizations, not just the Food Grains Bank, but I believe the Red Cross was involved as well as others. And I believe even the military uh, at some point was involved with military tents and stuff. So it was quite uh, elaborate, it was quite impactful, but its time had just passed. Uh, it was harder to get schools involved because they uh, were having more rigorous uh, kind of vetting processes for their outings and field trips and so forth. So uh, knowing that, we wanted to keep the idea of, of a refugee simulation or talking about refugee and migrant experiences but making it a, a much smaller scale and something that could be done in a much shorter period of time. And so that's how uh, the Force to Flee activity came to be where now we people just read about situations and in small groups, they make, uh, they discuss and they make decisions about what they want to do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh super fascinating backstory. Um, Michael, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Force to Fight, which is an online interactive activity and resource um, that follows some similar themes of, of exploring the lives of people living in conflict, um, but it's an online game or online activity. So it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be on the panel today, uh, Lauren. Um, and hello to everybody. Um, uh, Force to fight.ca uh, or prise au piège.ca in French. Um, it's an interactive online resource. It uh, follows the format of a choose your own adventure um, uh, approach. Uh, and um, it is designed to um, help uh, youth uh, and teachers um, uh, understand international humanitarian law and humanitarian issues that um, are associated with armed conflict around the world. Uh, it explores um, the uh, three different scenarios of youth in three different parts of the world um, and, uh, in terms of uh, South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, and it looks specifically at issues of uh, sexual and gender-based violence, uh, as well as child soldiers um, and um, forced um, uh, migration or refugees, um, similar to uh, Roberta's um, um, uh, resource. Um, in term, the goal is for students to uh, help protect the dignity and lives of the, uh, the three characters. Um, and it was, um, it's designed as either a standalone activity for teachers to uh, use within the classroom or uh, to accompany our resources, uh, our teacher um, resource, uh, resources that we do in our trainings for teachers. Um, and one of the reasons why we decided to go with an, um, um, an online um, uh, gamified sort of resources because our teacher resources um, are in a huge binder like this. Um, and, uh, and so as a result, um, uh, we needed to have something that was a little bit more accessible for teachers and for students. Um, and it was just um, fortuitous that we developed this a year ago or so. Um, a uh, year and a half ago um, and, uh, and launched it. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and now we find ourselves in a situation where teachers do require online resources. Uh, so, um, so it was good timing, I suppose. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I love the binder, that's great. 
Um, yeah, so kind of moving into that space of COVID-19, but also any other unexpected challenges as well as any takeaways from the development process or the launching process, um, maybe we'll get into that. Uh, Roberta, obviously yours is a in-person activity that has evolved over time. Um, so how ha have you been adapting it for this new COVID-19 era with social distancing and, and online learning and, and work? Um, have you tried it over Zoom or, or what have you been trying? <laughs> Yeah, so I did. I did try it over Zoom, uh, and it, uh, it it worked in, in a in a sense. But I have been uh, working uh, this past couple of weeks at really thinking about not just doing it over Zoom, not kind of trying to replicate the same experience, but how can we use tools within the Zoom platform to be able to uh, do a, the same activity. Uh, but not try to replicate it as if we're in the classroom. So this means maybe bringing in more imagery or more sounds. Um, uh, we would be moving people through the process maybe at the same time rather than groups doing it, going off and, and speaking uh, together on their own. Uh, so that is certainly a challenge for us uh, in terms of uh, this is an in-person experience. Uh, but the good thing is that it's not just for students. So we're also encouraging families to do it or people that are, are self-isolating at home that, that they can do it within uh, the, the people that they are in contact with. Yeah, that's a really great point. I, I think we're all starting to run out of activities and things to keep ourselves busy. I feel like I've watched everything on Netflix. So why not uh, sit around the kitchen table and, and try something different and, and really learn about the world around us through that experience? That's a really great point. Um, Michael, you've worked with a lot of teachers on your games. Are there any key takeaways or, or lessons learned from working with them and, and getting this activity into schools? Oh, there are tons of lessons learned um, and um, um, we'll be sharing some more of them in a, in a bit. Um, uh, just in terms of um, uh, uh, lessons learned, uh, the amount of time that is required to produce uh, an online resource um, that is thoughtful um, uh, was completely underestimated. Um, the, our resource uh, involved over 70, 70 people uh, in terms of its, um, from its uh, concept, uh, conceptualization to the final product. Everything from our procurement team uh, to our comms team, uh, our protection advisors. Um, and so, um, uh, and not to mention the um, umpteen hours worked uh, with, in collaboration with the uh, educational des design firm. Um, in uh, uh, to date, I think there are 5,000 different users uh, of um, the resource um, in over 100 countries. Um, uh, I'm not sure how the uptake happened in other countries. These things are beyond our control once they're out there. Um, but, um, you know, and uh, one of the other uh, important um, considerations for organizations, individuals, uh, considering uh, an online resource is to try and uh, embed the ability to collect analytics uh, for evaluative purposes. Um, and so um, as a result, um, you know, we know that there are 45% of users are teachers, 55% are students. We would like to see more students uh, use this. So we need to adjust our, um, um, our outreach efforts to try and get more teachers using this uh, to bolster the number of students. Um, uh, just in, in terms of evaluative purposes, um, we did a pilot as well as a, a beta um, um, a format of the resource and we got feedback from students like, um, uh, I really, this particular comment re resonated. Um, one student said when Justin Trudeau first announced that he is going to take refugees into Canada and provide them uh, to live adequately with our tax money, I wasn't too happy. Um, he says, um, uh, because his parents, uh, um, tax dollars and, and hard work were paying for that. And then he says, as a result of using the resource, uh, he's reconsidered his position. 
uh, and he sees how hard it is for um, for youth um, in uh, conflict situations. Uh, and so that's the kind of change in terms of um, awareness, in terms of values that I think all three of the panelists are looking for in the resource. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's crazy how things can grow and reach different parts of the world when they're online. Um, yeah, and, and reaching new people and changing ideas. Um, Hung, in addition to the vaccinator quest, you mentioned you've done a lot of quizzes and interactive activities linked to campaigns. Um, do you have any key takeaways or, or lessons learned in that space and how these kind of interactive activities can help encourage people to, to take further action? Yeah, I'd say the main takeaway for us whenever we launch a new campaign and then we try to uh, come up with a, a fun gamer or quiz uh, as a way to bring people in is how do you make it uh, fun, first of all? Um, how do you make it uh, simple uh, enough that it can communicate your, your message? And then how do you make it really shareable um, so that people, a lot of people are really interested in sharing uh, this resource and the, this content? Um, and then, uh, yeah, and that's that's pretty much uh, what we've seen is the success. Uh, whenever we we have um, a, a game or a quiz um, that's uh, really uh, successful, a lot of people are interested in it, is uh, because they found it fun and they would like to share it uh, with other people. Um, of course, we've had some some uh, failures <laughs> in the process, and that's kind of how we learn uh, as well that. Oh, if you try to make it too complicated, or if you you're trying to uh, communicate something that's that's too complex, then um, it's uh, it's not as fun and it's not as shareable. So keeping it really simple and and most of all fun, and then that way you know once people are are in uh, because they're they're interested in the in the topic through the game, then they would be interested in like okay I want to learn more. Um, I want to uh, educate myself a lot more. And then we link that uh, to a lot more uh, heavy, complex, uh, maybe blog posts that we have uh, that explain more on the issue. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I totally feel you about having failures, especially in the digital space. We think something's going to work and it doesn't always pan out. So we always have to be trying something new. Um, and yes, that's a really good point about how we have to pique people's interest. I mean, especially with online games and how we're all trying to reach people online nowadays. Um, we have to break through increasingly difficult and then once we have them hooked we can start bringing them along in the journey in terms of awareness of these issues and then further engagement um, so i guess my next question would be uh, what advice would you have for other organizations who are exploring these kind of options like we said it, it's hard to break through in social media and um, digital spaces in particular but then of course we're having to adapt the way that we think about in-person interactions as well right now um, and hopefully they there's a light at the end of the tunnel so hopefully we'll go back to a bit more normal in those in-person uh, interactions soon enough um, but yeah, if, if you could give a small organization considering gamifying their work um, some advice, what would you what would you tell them? Let's start with with Michael. Yeah, sure. I think that um, Hong's advice in keeping it simple is really important, um, just because of the proportions that these can take. Um, I guess if it were a small organization, what I would say is partner up. Um, is it actually your organization that has to create it or create it by itself? Perhaps there are already existing resources that can either be used or modified um, because of the, um, uh, the incredible amount of time uh, and money. Um, we wouldn't have been able to, to do um, uh, force to fightca without the support of uh, Global Affairs Canada. Um, and it cost us approximately $70,000, and that was on the cheap. Um, uh, and so um, I think that um, uh, it's also important to uh, think in advance about um, uh, rolling this out and the 
communication strategy that is required over time. Uh, we're still working a year and a half later on a comm strategy for rolling this out in phases. Um, and so since we put so much time into this, I think it's equally important that uh, organizations invest just as much time in terms of rolling this out and communicating or marketing this to various uh, youth or audiences. So I guess those were the, uh, the two things that I would uh, recommend. Cool. Yeah, I we're all about partnership here at CanWatch, so I think that's some really great advice. And yeah, I mean, games like Force to Fight are, are huge and they're a big undertaking. So you want to make sure that you're thinking ahead in terms of your communications and your analytics. Um, but in terms of, of keeping it simple, that's some really great advice and really tangible advice. Um, Hung, if you were going to give any other advice besides keeping it simple, is there anything else you would add? Um, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, uh, to suggest to people that if they want to start creating a game, maybe they can themselves uh, start thinking of like the last online quiz or the last game or the last piece of content that they shared. Uh, on their personal social network and why it, it made them want to share it um, and and how they can they apply that to the, the game or the issue that they uh, want to highlight. I think that would uh, really help with, uh, with, you know, trying to build something that's fun and, and shareable um, and definitely sharing it with uh, a lot of the, their colleagues. So we have a pretty big team here at one. And we're lucky in that sense that, you know, a, a small team will create this, uh, this fun quiz or this fun game and uh, people wouldn't have seen it yet, but then sharing it internally to your colleagues for feedback, that always helps uh, first to, you know, modify the game. And uh, every time we create something, we definitely have uh, multiple versions of it before we get to the final version because we've shared it and we got feedback and, and that's how we could improve on it. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, it's always good to have extra set of eyes on on your work. Uh, at some point, I think we all kind of stop seeing our own little typos and errors. So a fresh perspective is great. And I think it's also a really great bonding opportunity when it, it's a bit more of a fun activity or a game. Um, I know at Can Watch, right before uh, we took a holiday break, we all played a bunch of Kahoot games together and it was, it was a really great time to bond even though we're in a virtual setting. Um, it would have been nice to do something in person, but it, it was a nice compromise. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to build that internal morale as well. Um, yeah, Roberta, any lessons that you would share with other organizations? Yeah, so I, I would like to say that I, I agree with Hung and Michael. I think they brought up some really great points. I would add uh, to think about the time frame that you want this game, uh, you know, but what is the shelf life for the game? So for instance, are you gonna be adding lots of statistics in there? And are those statistics going to be outdated soon? Which is fine if you're running a certain campaign for a certain amount of time and this game goes along with that campaign. Uh, for us, we chose not to do that. So Force to Flee is something that's been around for several years uh, and there's not really statistics tied to it. Uh, and the other piece of advice I would give is that we we're talking about online games. Uh, so for instance, Force to Flee, while it is made as an in-person game, there, there is potential to do it via Zoom. Uh, and that is a lot less costly than spending $70,000 on a game. So there's just different ways that we can think about interacting in the virtual space. And so I would encourage people to think about that. Yeah, that's a really great point. I really think the, the shelf life one in particular is one that you need to consider, especially when you're looking at costs and timelines. Um, yeah, that's a really good point, um, especially, um, yeah. <laughs> the timeline i think it's great if also uh, consideration can be given to the idea of adding elements over time so that you don't have to reinvent something later a, a whole new game and so um we're ha going to be hopefully this year adding a fourth module a fourth scenario dealing with climate change uh, and conflict uh and indigenous issues and so uh we're looking for partners by the way 
Um, and so uh, if anybody's um, uh, watching the panel, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, uh, and so that way, um, you know, as, as Roberta's saying, there's a longer shelf life to the, uh, to the resource or to the game. Yeah, that's a really good point. I really like the idea of not having to reinvent the wheel. I think we kind of get stuck in that trap sometimes, especially in communications and public engagements we always have feel like we have to one up what we just did last time. And I think that's a really great way to reframe our thinking and love that you're you're looking for partners to expand your existing activities. Um, and that leads us into a really great point as we wrap up. Um, as a part of the Global Health Impact Exchange, we have um, an app. So we'll continue conversations there. We'll keep networking. We'll keep sharing different resources with each other. Maybe we can all share the kind of games and activities that we've been seeing, whether they're in global health or outside different industries. Uh, one of the main themes of this this big event as well is creativity. So we can all share those creative ideas with one another and keep that conversation going. Um, so as we wrap up, are there any final thoughts um, that any of you would like to share? Going once, going twice, sold. <laughs> Michael, did you have something? Uh, no, just thank you for the opportunity. I mean, um, uh, you know, those people who are attending um, the um, uh, the conference, the exchange, um, you know, they're, uh, uh, feel free to contact all three of us um, uh, if you wanted to um, have more information or, um, you know, before you launch into the creation or, and design of a, a resource, we're happy to help. Yeah, that's a really good point. And as I mentioned before, here at CanWatch, we're all about partnership and it's a really great opportunity to come together as a, as a community and learn from one another, especially right now, it's also International Development Week. So we're all focused on engaging Canadians in, in the great work that's being done around the world. Um, so with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you so much to all of you for joining our panel today. And thank you so much to all of our participants who have been listening in and uh, we hope you enjoy the the rest of the ghi x um thanks thanks bye thank you